Well, she was a former fourth grade teacher at Memphis Shelby County School System. She also studied at the University of Memphis. I mean, she is an educator. Karen Vogelsang is here today on Mid-South Viewpoint on Bot Radio Network. Karen, always good to see you, the executive director of Arise to Read. Well, thank you, Byron. I'm always glad to be here. I want to say a special thank you for our recent uh, Pastor's Wives Appreciation Luncheon, mm. where Arise to Read was one of the sponsors. We had a great time, and there was a great message, and there was there were there were a lot of laughs, um, and there was some really good food too. So we were very <laughs> very honored to be a sponsor for that event. Uh, I cannot imagine wearing the shoes of a pastor's wife. Oh my goodness! I know that's got to be a very <laughs> challenging and at times stressful uh, role, but uh, it was great to meet so many wonderful ladies that are serving their husbands and by doing that, serving the Lord. Amen. Amen to that. A lot we want to talk about today. Uh, One of the things I want to start off with was a mutual friend of ours, Eric Watkins from Red Door Urban Ministries, uh, recently posted, what a great month of advancing God's kingdom in the concrete jungle from (laughs) Child Abuse Prevention Thursdays with our dear evangelist uh, Carlene Compton Walmack leading us to our Kids Bible Club with our beloved Arise to Read friends. <laughs> <laughs> we love Red Door Urban Missions. We love it. I don't know if you know the story behind Red Door, but in 2020, we had um, a bunch of extra books after we gave away our reading, our summer reading packs for the summer of 2020. And so we reached out um, to some different Uh, partners to see if they had partners that needed books and we got one response and that was from Eric at Red Door Urban Missions so we loaded my truck up with about 500 or so books took them out to Red Door Urban Missions and struck up a conversation with Eric and now three years later we have been sponsoring an after-school Bible club there every Monday, and we have done a vacation Bible school in the summer of 2020. We've had a literacy extravaganza for the students in the summer in 2021, and when the, the uh, schools were closed, uh, Eric opened up Red Door Urban Missions to the families in the New Horizons apartment complex, and we had volunteers in the middle of the pandemic that were willing to go and serve the children there. So we have a phenomenal um, relationship with Red Door Urban Missions and um, Eric, my brother in Christ, is just absolutely amazing. I don't know how he does what he does, but the Lord has just blessed him abundantly with just an incredible mission, and he has such a passion for the children and families in those communities. Karen, I just love when ministries can connect and and serve each other and work together in reaching our community. You know. And in this case, uh, helping educate our children, combating this issue of literacy, which we know is a big issue, not only here in Memphis, but around the world. And we want to talk about that some today, too. Children who don't learn to read are sentenced to a lifetime struggle. You and I have talked about this over and over again on this program uh, and about what the efforts of Arise to Read are doing to address and engage the issue of literacy uh, in our community. Now, there's a film that was recently previewed, Sentenced. Yes. I think that movie portrays a lot of the issues that we're facing when it comes to literacy. Yeah, um, Jeff Martin became a friend um, of Donna Gaines, our founder, several years ago, and he's done a couple of small documentaries. And over the last four years, he worked on this uh this documentary film that's titled Sentenced. And the whole idea behind the film, what Jeff wanted to do was really get inside the lives of people from different walks of life. And so he had Fuji and his family from the Los Angeles area. He had a mom with four children with four different dads in um, the Bronx. He had another family, uh, just Anna and her son, uh, a former addict and Uh, you know, just really diving deep and then working with Haley in rural North Carolina and just showing what illiteracy does, not just to the person who's illiterate, but also to their families as well. And what the domino effect is. I mean, one of the stories that is just really heartbreaking and compelling is the story of Anna. Her son, um, Ruben, wants to be an architect, but she has court-ordered detox treatments, and they spend three hours 
traveling in New York City to get to these treatment centers. And Ruben is the one that has to take her because there's nobody else to take her. Mm -hmm. And so what's happening basically is Ruben is missing school. The likelihood that Ruben is ever going to be an architect is practically zero. So it's just it just goes back to what we've talked about before, Byron. If we don't have children reading on grade level by the time they leave the fourth grade, we know the national statistic is at 66 percent. That's two out of three kids will either require government assistance or they're going to be incarcerated. Mm -hmm. So literacy and crime, there is an absolute connection. And um, it all begins with education. One of the things the movie uh, suggest is there are actually no illiterate children, just mm. children who haven't learned to read yet. Yeah, yeah. I love that. I've, I, and I've witnessed that as an educator. You know, there are, I still remember um, a little girl named Patriana that I had in the fourth grade. Um, she was in my class the year I was named the teacher of the year. And when Patriana came to my class and I started doing my initial assessments, this sweet little girl could not read the word an, A-N, in the fourth grade. So she had been passed on from first grade to second, second to third, third to fourth. And so I, as an educator, had to meet her where she was. I couldn't send her home expecting her to read fourth grade text. I had to basically teach her as if she were a pre-K or a kindergarten student because she didn't have the foundational skills that she needed to be able to read right. to learn, which is what's expected in third and fourth grade. Um, Patriana made tremendous gains that year. Did she get to grade level? No, I, I was a good teacher, but <laughs> maybe, pro probably not a miracle worker, but she made tremendous gains and she got excited about reading and she could read by the end um, of our time together. So yes, there are children out there that just haven't been taught to read, but it doesn't mean that they can't learn to do it. Yes. Tell our listeners that the movie Sentenced uh, will be coming out in theaters, and I encourage you to go to the website sentencedfilm.com, and you can learn about release dates and times in our local yes. area when that movie is available. Karen, you traveled recently across the big pond. I did. Uh, you went to the 2023 World Literacy Summit. The summit brings together leaders from 85 countries representing over two-thirds of the world's population, all with a single focus, advocating, championing, educating on the vital importance of improving literacy levels across the entire globe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty big. But Isn't what, that crazy? But this wasn't just going to a conference. This wasn't just traveling international. You had a special presentation. You also received an award, I understand, at that. Uh, no, I didn't receive an award. Well, you were supposed um, to have received an award. <laughs> No, I didn't receive a, an award. The there. Queen didn't give you an award. No, you know she's gone. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry about that. No, but uh, you did have a special presentation. I did. I had a presentation to just talk about really how the community can come into schools and support schools, um, and just provided different examples of what we've done at Arise to Read now for the last ten years. You talk about earlier about the importance of collaboration. Collaboration is something that's very, very important to me, and very, very important to all of us at Arise to Read because teachers cannot fix the problem of illiteracy by themselves. Mm. Uh, it's really going to take all of us coming together to make a difference for children. So I went to, um, I was invited to speak at the summit to basically talk about how, regardless of where you live. By the way, the venue was at Oxford. Oxford University, yes. Can you believe it? This first generation college <laughs> student went and spoke at Oxford University. I love it. <laughs> just as just still kind of surreal and crazy to me. Um, but yeah, so I just spoke about how whether it's. Um, um, a small private urban school in Memphis or a large public school, the largest in Tennessee, how you can bring community members into schools um, and really help support the literacy, the foundational literacy skills of children. Or if we're talking about um, other community partners like Red Door Urban Missions or Memphis Athletic Ministries or the YMCA, those are all partners that we work with to help really bring in additional volunteers and work with students that may not be in second grade during the school day, which yeah. is our target. Um, and then the other thing, Arise to Read has been used in three different countries in Africa, in Ken Kenya, Malawi, um, and Uganda. Yeah. So even though it may be a little hut with a mud floor, there's what happened in Uganda is that the Arise to Read program was used to train the teachers in a primary school. Mm -hmm. 
And that program made such a big difference that the Minister of Education in Uganda said, what's going on at this particular school? Why are their scores so much better? And the answer was a rise to read. And so in 2020, Don and I were actually supposed to go to Uganda and train their primary teachers throughout the country <laughs> with the Arise to Read program. So um, just, yeah, so that was the focus of the presentation. Well, Karen, at this literacy summit you were at there in Oxford, England, who were some of the people that you met and also maybe some of the presentations that stood out to you, maybe caused you to be even more determined at the work that you do at Arise to Read? Yeah, I, Byron, i got to tell you, one of the most impactful presentations that I saw was from Dr. Nadine Gabb at um, Harvard's Graduation School of Education. And there was the, it was such a powerful presentation that I wrote some notes down that I, I just want to share with your listeners. First off, learning to read is not a natural process. If you go back in history, way, way back in history, right, uh, it was primarily it was it was physical labor right there wasn't necessarily a book to open and read or anything like that so it's not a natural process we have to be able to engage um, a brain a young child's brain to be able to learn to read and so some of the things that dr gab shared um, in order to help a child learn to read you've got to provide them with explicit instruction so that's one of the things that we do at arise to read but so many people will ask me especially those not involved in the education field why can't our kids read why do we have kids in high school that can't read and part of that is that one of the things that happens is we're not teaching children the mechanics of reading. And so one of the things I learned a little over a year ago is that second graders now are not being taught these high frequency words. That's the foundation of our program at Arise to Read. They're expected to know them when they walk into second grade. Well, we've got way too many children that start kindergarten and they don't even know their letters and sounds. And so then when we talk about learning to read, it really starts all the way back when that precious little baby is inside is inside mom and mom is listening to music talking to the baby um, reading singing whatever it may be but that baby is already starting to pick up on sounds one of my favorite examples is that when i had my boys when i brought them home they weren't scared when the dogs barked because they heard that sound over and over again so babies do hear sounds and that's where it all begins um, another thing once babies arrive then oral language starts but in order for a child to have those oral language abilities mom's got to take time looking in the eyes of that sweet little baby not looking at her phone or her tablet or on her computer mom needs to spend time talking to baby when when there's that eye-to-eye -eye contact what's happening and we've got so much brain imaging and brain science behind all this what's happening is all these cylinders are firing all these neural connections are mm -hmm. happening and that's what dr gab talked a whole bunch about the other thing was that while that oral language is developing kind of from the time they're born till the time they enter school then they're starting to learn letters and sounds and so a lot of times what we're having to do at arise to read is in second grade we're having to address well that's an a what what sound does an A make? And so children are starting to learn to read those sounds. But I think one of the most powerful things she said was that we have situations now where there's so much pressure on teachers for teachers to teach at a child's grade level, even though that child may not be at grade level. So for example, if your student was in my class and they were in the fourth grade, just like Patriana, I was expected to teach Patriana at a fourth grade level, but that would have been a disservice to her. I needed to teach her where she was. Unfortunately, what happens is there is so much pressure for, um, for teachers that once they get into third grade, they stop teaching those foundational skills. They just go right in thinking that children are ready to read to learn and they're not. And so th the funny story about her presentation, Sunny, uh, funny and sad all in the same breath is this was in a plenary situation a plenary presentation in the Sheldonian theater beautiful building and right near the end of her presentation one of the organizers of the summit came up and told us that we all had to evacuate because there was a bomb threat oh my. I followed her out because <laughs> I wanted to ask her a question 
And my question was very simple. I started with the statement. I agree with everything that you said. I understand why you said everything that you said. What do we need to do to make it change? And she said, simply, it's going to take reform. Well, it is going to take reform. But you know what? It can Reform can start with one volunteer working with a child, helping them learn those foundational skills before which they ever get to third grade. Which you're discovering and have been for the past 10 years at Arise to Read. Yeah, yeah. Our results this year are incredible. We've got... Um, 13% of our children that we pre-tested that were in the program were not on grade level at pre-test, and we have 70% of our students on grade level at post-test. Our volunteers are making a tremendous difference. As we talk about literacy, we talk about uh, a rise to reads impact on our children in our community. And you, you, as you mentioned, you returned from this summit uh, with a new perspective, a, a greater vision for the issue of literacy after you heard these wonderful speakers and just uh, got to feel really what around the world, things are happening around the world addressing this issue. Yeah, and it's not just in Memphis. No. It's not just in the United States. This issue of illiteracy is something that affects everyone. I mean, or, or many people, I should say, not everyone, but in some respects it is everyone because if we have children that can't read and they drop out and they resort to a life of crime, it does affect everybody in the community. Yes. But this is not something that's just isolated to Memphis. It's, it is a worldwide problem. And I think that's a good point we make here. And as we talk about that and talk about social issues in our culture affecting the way our children are educated, forcing our children to deal with complex moral subject matters such as gender identification, before really attaining the, the proper comprehension for reading levels, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, the bottom line is, bef before you ever start branching off into other topics, um, we the, the most important thing that we can do in the world of education is make sure that our children are reading by the time they leave the third grade. There's so much emphasis um, as a state right now on making sure that children are reading on grade level by the time they leave the third grade. And then if they're not, we've got to make sure that we put the programs and supports in place to help a child because a child might have special learning needs. And if they have special learning needs, we need to be able to address those learning needs for that child. But um, there, there's so much opportunity out there to help our children yes. learn to read. Um, and, and really, that's the bottom line. The focus from in early childhood needs to be teaching a child the foundational skills so that they can put those foundational skills together to read. And you know our ultimate hope at Arise to Read is that we want our children to be able to read so that they can read God's Word, Amen. so that they can fall in love with the God of the world. Yes. Well, Karen, you remember when you and I were in school, there was a little song, a little ditty that said, you know, school days, school days, you know, I'm trying to remember all the words, uh, reading and writing and arithmetic, you know, uh, the basic, the foundations, you right. know, but you really need to propel, you know, students into the work world, their career, their future. Right. It's so foundational. Yeah. But <laughs> we've just stirred the pot with so many, you know, issues. And, and we don't, we're not here to discuss all that today. We really want to just highlight really the great work of Rise to Read continues to do in our city and uh, opportunities for our listeners to engage and be part of yeah. this uh, movement. Uh, Shelby County District Attorney Steve Mulroy announced his intent to seek the death penalty in the murder case of Ezekiel Kelly, who was accused of driving around Memphis and shooting people at random on September 7th of 2022. Do you remember Ezekiel Kelly being one of your students? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Was that like second grade, I think? He was or? in my second grade class. Yeah. What do you remember about Ezekiel? I remember a lot about Ezekiel. Um, Ezekiel had uh, a very big smile. His mom was very involved in his education. He had a little brother. He was not a behavior problem during the school day. He was behind um, in both reading and math, but he wasn't significantly behind as many of my students were. Um, but when he was getting in trouble, he was getting in trouble outside of school because the gang members were already recruiting him and bringing him into the fold. And they wait, were getting, wait, wait a minute, Karen. Wait a minute. He, he's only in second grade. Yes. And you're, you say gang members are already recruiting him? Yeah. Yeah. We had to call the gang unit out on um, Ezekiel and one of our other second grade students and a fourth grade student. And the gang unit came out to talk to the boys about what could happen in life if they continued down this path. And um, on that date, 
Uh, I was getting ready to go to bed and opened up Facebook, which I don't normally do before I go to bed. And my daughter had posted something about what on earth is going on. And I scrolled down and saw the picture. And even though it's been many years since I've seen Ezekiel, as soon as I saw his picture, I knew it was him. And obviously heartbroken, you know, you, as a teacher, whether you're a teacher, pastor, coach, whatever, you never want to see any of the children that you've yeah. had a long interaction with um, do things like Ezekiel did on that night. So it was a, it was a very heartbreaking heartbreaking thing to see happen. It was a terrifying night, as you well know, in yeah. that city. I remember being concerned for the safety of my family and mm. you trying to make sure everybody was in, in a safe place and just right. thinking about things that were happening. And you know, the very next day, I had uh, Pastor Tony Wade of Divine Life Church came mm. and we did a show to pray for our city because, I mean, it emotionally just, you know, stirred things up big yeah. time. And we wanted to put a gospel lens on this and pray and talk about that. It's heartbreaking yeah. to know that a uh, that this took place in this young man. What could have been done to prevent this tragic destiny, if you will, for yeah. Ezekiel, do you think? Um, that That's a very loaded question, and there's so many different answers. I think one of the things for us at Arise to Read, one of the things after that happened with Ezekiel that was really laid heavy on my heart is that we need to find a way to follow children. One of the most common questions I get asked as the executive director at Arise to Read, is what happens to the children that you serve after they leave second grade? Well, I don't know, because I don't have enough volunteers to be able to follow children um, into the third grade. Um, we are going to be partnering with um, a local nonprofit organization called Strive. Um, Strive works has worked with children in one elementary school with Memphis Shelby County Schools on um, what's called the growth mindset, you know, basically thinking about how what, what are the different things that you can do to see yourself grow as an individual. And then at the same time that they're teaching these children these different skills, they're also exposing them to different careers. So what we're looking at doing is having the volunteers from this particular organization basically be a rise to read volunteers in second grade and then follow them to third grade yeah. with the strive program mm -hmm. so i think one of the things that um, so many of our children like ezekiel need is they need to have positive mentors follow them mm -hmm. throughout their school career it can't be one and done uh, you know like i said i've got a picture still in my phone of ezekiel and his mom um, another teacher and i had created an outdoor classroom at keystone elementary and he and his mom had just gone out there and he picked a cucumber you know, most of our students in that Raleigh Fraser community, um, they never saw a cucumber growing or they saw a watermelon or Brussels sprouts or green beans or anything else like that. And so he has this big smile on his face because he just picked a cucumber and his mom was standing there right next to him. She always attended the parent teacher conferences. So, I mean, this was a situation where you've got an involved mom. You've got a student that, for the most part, is making good choices during the school day. But it's relationship, right? Yeah. It's relationship. Yeah. And the gangs became a relational um, setting for Ezekiel. Yes. And instead of guiding him down the right path, he was guided down a wrong path. And Ezekiel, in the process, made some very bad choices. Karen, do you ever feel that you're trying to arrange the deck chairs on the Titanic and you're in a losing battle, or what? No. I mean, I mean, what motivates you to keep going when when you look at the statistics? Well, one of the things, because I know that our volunteers are making a difference. I mean, they're so. I'll, I'll tell you one quick story. So we grew from two Bible clubs last school year to nine Bible clubs this school year. And in one of those Bible clubs, a little boy made a profession of faith, and he was baptized, and his grandmother flew in from Ecuador to see his baptism. Um, that's what keeps us going, things like that. When we hear, uh, when I get to see a student that I knew in second grade and got to see him a year ago in fifth grade and hear that he still loves reading, um, I know that whether you're a teacher, a coach, a volunteer, a pastor, whatever, when you invest in a child's life, you're planting seeds and you can make a difference for that child that can last a lifetime, even if it's just one and done. Yes. So wow. that's that's what that's what keeps us all going. It's very hard sometimes, and it's been hard this year because we pre-tested over 1,600 students, and half of them, um, half of them scored 
uh, below a mid-kindergarten level. So they were very far behind. But then we look at the gains that the children that we were able to serve. I wish we could have served all 1,600. We were only able to serve 700. And that's because, because you need more volunteers. Need more volunteers, yeah. And that's an what, hour a week, a yeah. commitment of an hour a week, and you can change the life of two children. So our Bot Radio Network listeners right now can engage this issue of literacy in our city by just volunteering one hour a week? An hour a week, that's it. Basically, you're just sitting down with a child. And you're teaching them to read. At their school, right? At their school, so it's during the school day. Yeah. Um, so what will happen in the fall, we'll have our annual kickoff. It'll be at the end of August. And between now and the end of and that kickoff, we will work with our principal partners and we'll find out the schedules for each of the schools. Uh, the programming does take place during the school day. Uh, in fact, I just got through talking with Todd outside and Todd wants to volunteer in the fall. He wants to be at a school that um, is either near home or work that's during his lunch hour or on his way in. He's realized that we've all got to step in and make a difference. And so he'll work with two children, one each for 30 minutes, and he will basically help build um, the children's sight word vocabulary so their their vocabulary as well not just recognizing the word but understanding how to use that word properly and then spending time reading playing games interacting um, engaging different learning modalities so it gets those all those cylinders firing inside that little brain yeah. and they'll go home with 10 to 12 brand new books over the course of the year because we know that so many of our children don't have access to text in these under-resourced communities there's not a lot library that they can walk to and then sadly um, we have schools that they might have a library but they don't have a librarian so they don't have an opportunity to check out books at school so yeah it's a very very light lift an hour a week and two children that's it and you can make a difference in the life of a child Karen it's always great to see you and have you here to just express the really the excitement that a rise to read is engaging this issue really from a vision of a school teacher donna Gaines. something had to be done and yep. god heard the prayer yeah <laughs> god answered her prayer god answered yeah. her prayer this is the lord's mission this yes. isn't ours this okay. is the lord's mission so if folks want to know more information, what's the website? Website is arise to read.org and it's A R I S E the number two read.org or you can call 901-347-5545 and our wonderful office manager Christy will answer the phone and if she uh, if she's not able to answer the call then one of us in the office will and we will be more than happy to talk to you <laughs> about how you can get involved. I love it. Karen Vogelsing, God bless you, my dear sister. God bless you. Thank you so much for what you're continuing to do with enthusiasm and just uh, hearing God's heartbeat for our children and uh, and doing the great work you're doing with your team at Arise to Read. Well, thank you so much, Byron. I always appreciate coming on your show and being able to share with your listeners just an opportunity where they can make an impact, not just for these two children, but for our city as well. So it's going to take all of us. So I really thank you for the opportunity to share. Amen. Well, friends, that's all the time we have on this edition of Mid-South Viewpoint. Thanks for stopping by. I'm Byron Tyler, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.